Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 16. It seems like a year ago since I put the last one out, but we're back and I'll do more. I say that every single time. But um, today I am joined by a new unicorn. Phil, welcome. How are you doing? Thanks very much, Connor. I'm doing great, thanks. And um, welcome to you to a lovely New Zealand summer day. Yeah, well, I'm in Canada now, so we are at the very tail end of summer. And um, it hasn't, uh, there's no snow yet. I haven't felt the Canadian winter just yet, but I'll keep you in the loop. Oh. Phil, can you tell us who you are, what you do, what your background is, all that fun stuff? Well, thanks very much, Connor. So, yes, I'm Phil Cox, um, hail from UK originally, um, and I am half of Avalon Web uh, Avalon Marketing and Website Design Limited. So we are um, a two-man company, or a man and woman, and um, we work on an agency basis. We hire, we hire uh, consultants as needed, contractors, and we specialise in nutting out difficult website issues for our clients. Uh, we've been going for five years now. Um, Avalon itself was a marketing company and been going for about 10 years before that. But we added the website design bit um, about five years ago and we've been going from strength to strength ever since. Lovely. So let me just pull it right back to the start because I have a little bit of a background of what you've done. And one of the things that you have done is you worked in the public sector. So how does that fit into the timeline of you um, running Avalon? Yeah, that's interesting. It was certainly um, a, a good apprenticeship for me. Um, I had a first career uh, in the military, learning to run communications projects and stuff. So uh, big radio systems and so on. And eventually, when IT was invented, we got into that as well. Um, when I left the military, I was a public sector project manager consultant. And so I went from ministry to ministry, helping them organize jobs uh, and getting things done. So it really appealed to my attitude of just get on and do it uh, and make sure you remove any barriers on the way. Um, I brought that to bear over here when I emigrated to New Zealand, uh, which was 10 years ago. And since then I've been working in both public sector and the commercial world, um, doing pretty much the same sort of thing, helping organizations um, remove barriers, reduce risk and get stuff done. So then for the last five years, settled down, um, trying to build my own business up with Avalon. And the idea there is that um, we'll bring those extra project management skills to any work we do for clients. So when they say we need a website, we'll generally be able to tell them on what day it's going to be running and how much it's going to cost them to do it. Um, and clients really like that because they get some sort of certainty about the project. Cool. Well, I want to get back to that. That's a very interesting point. But can you just tell us a bit about Avalon and like the kind of the specifically the kind of work you do, especially if you're like a web design and marketing agency, um, who the kind of clients are that you work with and maybe talk about some of the your funnest projects. Funnest projects. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll get onto that. Certainly. Um, well, in the in the four years that I've been five years that I've been with Avalon. Um, what we've done is kind of redirected the company a bit. The main direction was marketing um, and the company would work with councils and so on across the country, helping them with surveys, branding, that sort of thing, um, universities and so on. Um, since adding the web design side, my focus has been to, um, to build a reputable brand and an approach about uh, solving nutty business problems with websites. We started off in the first few months producing simply brochures um, and many for local uh, organizations around here in the wire wrapper. I can tell you more about that in a bit. Um, mm -hmm. But the problem with websites is it's not like going into a shop and saying, I liked what you sold me last year. Can I have another one? With websites, you generally just sell one and maybe improve it over, over time. And that's been my focus. But we have to keep looking for new customers. So it's taken a different sort of business development approach to what I've, what I've been used to in the past. Um, so we're out there reaching out for organizations that have difficult business problems. They're wasting time on paperwork um, or on other manual processes. And we can bring the solution in a website that's visible to either just them, just their staff, or indeed the public. Mm -hmm. Some interesting uh, 
some interesting jobs have come out of that. Um, we've had some really great clients over in uh, UK where we're responsible for the I Love Cows website. Um, that's cows with an E, the city rather than the animal. Um, I say that surrounded by paddocks and a number of cattle beasts uh, as I sit here. But um, the I Love Cows website is about, um, is about engaging business with tourism and making sure that visitors know what's available when they come to visit the city on the Isle of Wight. Um, that's been fascinating and it's been about events, advertising, some really good um, search engine optimization, getting themselves seen on Google um, and generally selling tickets to stuff as well to, 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 uh, to get the money coming in. So can I specifically touch on this? Um, yeah. So, you know, working with councils or government organizations is something that I think a lot of people who work in the creative space aspire to because there's somewhat decent income you know like it's sometimes it's more consistent and higher paying than some companies in the private sector but it's very hard to get your foot in the door how did you approach getting your foot in the door with these councils yes it is that's a really good point um a number of ways um i can just think of the ones off the top of my head um i'll give an example for the chamber of commerce in wirearapa it's a, it's been a partnership we haven't just sold them a product we've held their hands all the way through chambers of commerce are generally charitable organizations they're not flush with funds and so they need to know they're getting a really good deal and that they're not risking the the members the members money that they've contributed um and so it's been very much a hand-holding partnership approach and so what that means is we need to be able to spot issues and opportunities before they happen and then talk the, uh, the board of the, of the organization through those opportunities and I think building up trust like that really helps going in with the cold call um, business development approach wouldn't work for that sort of organization mm -hmm. so just um, that initial conversation or that initial start working with them did you initiate it or did they initiate it Okay, yeah, um, so I would have initiated that. Um, I made sure we were members of the local Chamber of Commerce to start with. And um, once you've got something visible to the public, you can then use that as your demonstration for other customers. So for instance, I went to the, um, the Cows Chamber over in the Isle of Wight through a contact and said, well, look at what we've done for Business Wire Upper. We've got the whole directory of businesses. Each individual business has a member who's responsible for their profile. They can go on and modify that. And we can sell tickets to events that Business Wire Upper are running. We carried that same model over to uh, Cows and they loved it. They, they adopted the same sort of thing, but taken it a lot further. Um, there's a, there's a, a more commercial approach to that website, uh, complete with ad, on-page advertising, um, which Business Wire Upper hasn't adopted, but that's a smaller, a smaller organization. Um, one of our other um, websites that we're very proud of has not been a big earner. We're proud of it because of what it does and the outreach it's got. And that's the Retired Working Dogs New Zealand charity website. So that started off, that, that was a labor of love from day one. Um, it started off from scratch. It's now quite a substantial site. Um, and if I tell you that they're getting 120 page views per month, it tells you that it's not a trivial site. Um, we've added a number of capabilities to that, including a, a library of documents, um, automated business process for things like if I want to submit a do dog for adoption or if I want to adopt a dog, all of that is run by clever forms or smart forms. Um, the president and the staff of the of the uh, of the board have very little involvement and the idea is to make life easy for them and and to engage with folk out there so it's been really good for fundraising for the board too awesome well let's have a chat about avalon and the kind of story so you see there's two of you um who is the other half of avalon the, 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 the much better half is is my wife karen who um comes from a marketing and research background the research was not into marketing per se, but into website usability. So you can see why we joined, we, we rolled up the business capabilities. So now um, I'll nut out a, a, a thorny business problem and then Karen will say, but that's not how people think. You need to get it to look like this and to behave in this way. And the strength of that is we end up providing a solution to our customers that's almost what they were thinking of without having to go through all the heartache of workshops and in intensive one-to-ones and so on. We can generally come up with the sort of thing they were after right at the start. And it gives you that warm feeling that the, the, the solutions you're providing, they're going to get used. Mm -hmm. Nice. 
And so one thing that we briefly talked about before is you use uh, a lot of contractors to deliver the work that you do. So can you tell me a bit about like the approach that you've taken with that, um, how it works, the found them, all that type of stuff? Yeah, certainly. Um, realized fairly quickly that the, the model, the business model we've got is pretty unscalable at the point where Karen's too busy and I'm too busy, then that's it. We can't accept any more work. So that wasn't going to that wasn't going to work. What we looked at employing and we don't have the turnover to safely employ consistently. So uh, we discounted that. But con contracting works really well for us. We've identified and built up trust with a number of individuals, each with their own niche skills, that we can ring up or email and say, are you free for the next couple of days and drop them some work. Uh, they'll, they'll work on it remotely and then let us know when it's done. Some of those contractors are local. We have uh, a couple of great graphics design folk here around the wire upper who do really high quality work. We've got a lady who comes from um, the li library and information management side of public sector and she's absolutely spot on with some of the views of how information management should work. So I often get, get her advice when working on the site. Um, and we have a couple of contractors over in UK as well. Um, and so that helps us with the time zone difference because quite often they can deliver solutions by the time I get up the next morning, which is hugely efficient for, uh, for getting, getting stuff moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I've discovered the same thing, like working with um, businesses in New Zealand. You know, I work with other freelancers on the Unicorn Factory, the place yep. to be if you're looking for freelancers. But yeah, they work during the day. I work when they are asleep. It's like a 24-7 service that we offer. More a 24-5 service because we don't work on weekends. So. Um, okay, well, so I'd be super interested to hear like how you manage um, these contractors when you work across different time zones. Or do you manage them? Do you take like a more hands-on role when you're working on the projects? Or are you purely project managing at all? It's interesting. I'm, I'm looking for their creativity and I don't want to box them in too much. But there is a risk that if I say I need you to do exactly this, then all they're going to produce is what I could have done anyway. Um, that's fine if I'm just running out of time, but I need um, more of their input than that. And I think customers pay us for some of the breadth, breadth of input that they get. So I'll give them a fairly loose description of what the solution needs to be able to do. And I'll give them a rough idea of how much effort I think is needed. And because of the trust and the, that's built up over the time we've been working with them, they, they know pretty much the sort of thing I'm trying to do. And they'll go and build um, or design and come back to me with one or two options and say, were you thinking of this sort of thing? And, and they've never missed the mark doing that. It's not the same as a contractor that I haven't met before and I'm taking on, um, say, a strength of a CV uh, in another country, perhaps. That can get really tricky. There's a lot of risk involved in that. And I admire the guys who run jobs like that. That does take a lot more project management. I think I'm lucky that my the contractors I use make it easy for me, I think. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, one thing that I wanted to talk to you about is potentially, you know, the impact that this whole pandemic has had on your business over the last, because I mean, it is a big factor and like, it would be, in, I'd be interested to hear your perspective on it, like how it's changed your business, how it's impacted your clients' businesses and maybe like what kind of adjustments you've made along the way to kind of, um, yeah, I suppose adjust to this new situation that we all find ourselves in. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's really key. Excuse me. As you can tell, we've got some dogs here as well. Yeah. So um, we, when lockdown first hit in New Zealand, there was a sort of a, a sharp intake of breath, which lasted about a week, I guess, when things went very quiet. Um, mm -hmm. In true Kiwi fashion, um, businesses were incredibly receptive to new ways of working, um, very resilient. And after that first week, the call started up again and people had basically moved into working remotely um, and realized what the new business model required. And then they were getting in touch. And that, um, after that first peaceful week, we took a number of calls about, um, can you add to my existing 
brochure type website? Can you add an online store? Can you add an online booking system? Um, I need something for my staff to record their time on. So they were suddenly realizing that having online tools to help them run their business was going to save them massive amounts of time and heartache. So after that first week, we became hugely busy uh, putting together these solutions for organizations, not just around the wire upper, but are all around New Zealand as well. Um, the, it, the lockdown and COVID in general hasn't changed the way we work very much because we've generally worked remotely anyway, so it's more of the same. But what I'm really missing is that my own personal um, preference for business development is to get in the door and have a chat with someone. And of course, that's a lot less likely now. Um, I'm spending time on the phone, whereas previously it would have been time at a coffee, at a cafe with a, with a drink with somebody. Um, and, and so that sort of style has had to change. Um, phone, phoning is still pretty effective. I, I hate to go back to just pure emails. I need to talk to people, I think, to get my points across um, and people react well to that. So as long as I'm still able to engage through Zoom, through phone calls and so on, then it's become less important to spend time over a coffee. Uh, but that's been the change to the way we've, the way we've worked. The clients are still coming, which is good to see. Uh, through Unicorn Factory, we're reaching out. Um, we've got new clients in Auckland, uh, Christchurch. So I think what the organization has done for us is increased our reach. We're no longer just um, Avalon marketing and website design in the wire wrapper. We've, uh, we, we, we always were keen to reach out and look for customers in UK, in Wellington and so on. But Unicorn Factory is providing the means with which to do that and successful means as well, because those can, those jobs are happening now. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Well, I appreciate it. It's very good to hear. <laughs> but um, what, I want to get back to you to hearing about your approach of finding clients. So, so you are a person that prefers like the in-person conversations. What kind of suggestions would you have for someone who like, you know, needs to find work and thinks, you know, and would like to try it. Because I think a lot of people are quite, you know, get stressed out by the idea of having to go and like meet people in person to discuss business. What is like some approach that has kind of worked for you? Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting because, um, yeah, so often there is that initial fear because the person you're talking to may be the fund holder or may be very experienced in the job or maybe very senior. And, and we tend to think those are reasons to be nervous about them. Actually, they're not. They're just another guy doing a job who happens to have a budget or happens to have been in the job a long time. And once you sit them down over a coffee and start chatting about what makes them tick, they're just, uh, there's just another guy having a chat over a coffee. Um, I've found um, in New Zealand, that's even more true than it is in UK. I mean, in, in UK, you can get folk who hide behind the suit they're wearing, et cetera, or the post they've got. Um, over here, I think uh, people are generally more open to conversations about what they did at the weekend and what their home's like and so on. So getting to know the person is really key. The, the advice, I'd, uh, advice I'd, I'd give is always appeal to the person and not just put the words down on an email. So um, Unicorn Factory will provide an introduction. Um, at that point, it's just a simple email, but my first step is to, is to uh, open the door to a phone call with them because you can spend an awful long time telling people what you do by email and they may not even read it but if you can have that conversation and say tell me about the problem and this is how I think I can help I found getting getting that first call into them has, has been really helpful more helpful than just an email mm -hmm. and so with the kind of uh, projects that you do how many calls or how many meetings does it usually require for you to kind of seal the deal um for a small job, I'd say a, a couple are sufficient, a couple of uh, phone calls. Um, and I always, always insist on capturing those and putting something down on an email anyway and saying, this is what we've agreed to do. Uh, we'll be cracking on with this. Thanks, thanks for uh, approving this by phone. Um, let me know if there's any problem with this and we'll, we'll get on with the work. Um, for larger problems, uh, larger, larger projects, um, I'd like to go and see them. I like to present to them so they are absolutely clear about what they're getting and they've had the opportunity to, to ask questions. And by, by presenting in their own location, you can generally get more people in the room. And so you get a wider view. Mm -hmm. Often you'll be presenting in, or you'll be championed by the organization's head of communications is quite a fundamental role. Maybe an IT person, they want to bring you in to solve a particular problem. 
but you want to present to more than that because those are going to those will be the individuals who will agree with what you're doing anyway and you're looking for folk who disagree and give you more useful feedback and say why aren't we including this that and the other that's really important so if you can get to present to an audience of five or six folk in a in a workshop or in a presentation that will be worth a lot more to you and will improve the quality of the finished product so for those bigger projects um, a number of calls some emails and backers and forwards and then maybe a pdf describing your proposal and then finally a presentation so they're worth but they're worth the extra commitment nice um oh that's that's great and like i i've gotten so much feedback from people who have contacted you through the unicorn factory that that is something that you have done that a lot of people haven't done that they appreciate um you know jumping on calls is like key like i don't understand why people don't do it more often but yeah i mean that just goes to show with how you've approached it that it just works yeah, um i find cold calling yeah. still the same challenge that everybody else does um so it's this this isn't this discussion we're having now is not the same as cold calls which are really difficult i absolutely get that and i avoid them as much as everybody else does but these calls we're talking about are not cold calls they're just about it, taking the relationship forward so uh, like so with the unicorn factory work comes to you but do you also have any strategies that you put in place besides going like or how do you find new work if you have to and do yeah. you do you focus like on a particular type of client when you go researching potential clients or yeah what we'll do is once we've um, got a relationship with a client either through a good piece of work or we've been with them for a long time uh, supporting mm -hmm. them um We'll generally ask them the question, how do you feel about what we're doing? Is there anything we need to change? And then the next, assuming that you get a positive answer, the, the, sixth, the next question is then, would you uh, recommend us to other folk you know in the industry? Um, and who would you talk to? What would you say? Let's get the wording right and um, let us know what feedback you get. And can you get us an introduction to go and speak to them? So we would use successful clients to recommend us and get us a toe in the door so that we can start the same conversation again with colleagues of theirs. Um, and you end up with this sort of tree-like structure as each individual introduces you to a bunch more. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't assume that all of this is gonna be successful. The reason you're going for one to many to many more is because a number of them are going to fall by the wayside. But if you can keep getting one or two good leads out of each customer, then that's gonna keep, uh, keep the machine rolling along that's fantastic so um what is the plan for avalon marketing and web design then so over the next few years do you are you someone that makes a specific plan or set specific goals or do you like kind of just rolling with the punches and kind of just you know ad adapting and adjusting in real time well, we've, we've certainly had to adapt and adjust as, as challenges have come up. Our aim at every re annual review with our accountants, our aim has been next year, we're going to double our turnover. I don't think we've actually achieved that in any particular year, um, but it gives us that sort of focus of what we've got to do better. And it starts the conversation with the accountant of, well, you're spending too much on coffees or you're spending, you're not earning enough on, uh, on hosting fees, for example. So uh, that sort of focuses the conversation. Yes, it would be great to double turnover. And, and what would be even more important to me would be to get to the stability and the income where we could employ. Um, Wire Appa, just like everywhere else, um, needs to find extra jobs for folk. Now, we don't need web experts. We don't need design experts. We need people who are willing, willing to learn and to understand the challenges we have and learn to address engineering challenges. That doesn't make them a web expert. But if they can come to us with that sort of attitude, then it'd be lovely to be able to take them on on a permanent basis. Awesome. Well, we're approaching the final section of our little interview. And I usually reserve this last part to um, let you share some tips and tricks for upcoming web designers or marketers. How can they get in the industry? What is something that you wish you knew a long time ago? What is something that you can share with people watching this? I think one of our biggest strengths is something that it took me a while to learn. And so that definitely falls into the the bracket of something I wished I'd known from the start and that is because you approach this with lots of I've got the determination and I'm going I'm going to succeed in this you don't always think wider 
but the real strength has come and, and our clients love this. It's on the strength of the relationships with the support teams. Now you could call that contract contractors, I guess, but it's the, it's the organizations that perhaps have authored some of the software we use or provide some of the services, services we use. Um, what I found is by treating them with respect and insisting on the occasional voice call or Zoom call and not just emails, We've built up a relationship with them, which means when they see a question from us, it floats to the top of their in tray, they get on with it and we get reliable answers quickly, which means I can go back to the customers quickly with, with, with responses. Um, and that includes the range of uh, hosting that we use, the themes that we use, and the narrow set of plugins that we rely on, things like smart forms and so on. Um, although every engineering problem is different for websites, the solution is self and built using the, uh, uh, our same sort of hosting, our same sort of themes, our same sort of form software, and then the clever stuff goes in on top of that. Now, if I can rely on the people that provide all that stuff for overnight solutions, then I can go back to the client with a really good service. I love it. So basically build your relationships with the contractors you work with, and then you can always deliver. Yeah, Fantastic. Cool. Phil. How can we find out more about you? How can we get in touch with you? Well, I've, I've got a, a kind of a slightly dusty CV sitting on uh, LinkedIn. And uh, so, so I'm always on there. But my main, my, my main modus operandi right now is through, is, is through Unicorn Factory. I'm, I'm use, using it regularly. I'm watching the stats. Um, I point to it using my Facebook profile and so on. I think um, the, the benefit of the way Unicorn Factory works is by getting exposure out there. And if I can share my Unicorn Factory profile and links on the other media that are around, then that gets, gets it in front of people. You can never have it in front of too many people. And if it means going onto LinkedIn and saying, hi, I did this video on Unicorn Factory, go and have a look, then that's the way to do it. That's awesome. Phil, I appreciate your time. It's always fun chatting to you. And for everyone else, um, yeah, that was episode number 16. Um, and we're going to have plenty more of these coming. Plus, now that I'm really getting this whole setup sorted out here, we're also going to be doing some additional content that you'll be finding out about soon. But thank you very much for watching this entire video. And all the links um, reference talking about different things like um, the link to Phil's profile will be down below. And I would love to hear from you. If you have any ideas, comments, all that kind of stuff, please let us know. Other than that, have a fantastic day.